We know we can bring every need we have to God through prayer. But sometimes our own needs are so deep, our own pain is so raw that we don't even know how to express it. So what do we do in those moments? Alistair Begg addresses this question today on Truth For Life Weekend as he continues our study in Romans chapter 8. Now, we're at verse 26, and I think you'll be relieved about that because that's where we should be. And it is here that we're told that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. He's been describing life in the Spirit. It is the Spirit that is at work in creation. It is the Spirit that is at work in our lives. And it is the Spirit now who helps us in our weakness. Let's address this in two ways. First of all, acknowledging this to be true generally, and then acknowledging it to be true specifically in the context that Paul gives us here. Paul uh, has been very clear concerning the nature of weakness, and classically so in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 12. And as he reaches the apex of his argument, he says in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12, to keep me from becoming conceited or from getting a big head, because, he said, I've had revelations of God that are so unbelievable that I couldn't even begin to talk about them. And that could give me a sense of dominance and priority and so on. And God, recognizing that, to keep me from getting a big fat head, he gave me a thorn in my flesh. We don't know what it is. He'd asked the Lord three times if he would take it away from him, and three times the answer came back, no. Because, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. Okay, he says, therefore, deduction, if that's the case, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. For, he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. It's paradoxical, isn't it? It's ironic. Especially when you set it within the context of 21st century America. Because the one thing that you're not supposed to admit to is weakness. Everyone is a winner in America. In a book called Nurture Shock, New Thinking About Children, the book says modern parents are wanting to nurture so skillfully that Mother Nature will gasp in admiration at the marvels their parenting produces from the soft clay of children. The assumption is that thinking highly of oneself is a prerequisite for high achievement. The discovery of their own personal inadequacy and the discovery that in that inadequacy there is the opportunity for growth, and for achievement. We're not talking about a wrong sense of inadequacy. We're talking about a proper sense of inadequacy. The proper sense of inadequacy that comes when you jump rope with ropes, and you realize you're a klutz, (laughs) and you realize that when you saw uh, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard doing that thing, and you tried it, you look like the village idiot. That's fine. You're not Sugar Ray Leonard. You're not going to be. Relax. He probably can do many of the things you do. But you see, the reason I mention this is because if we're going to read our Bibles, and we're going to allow our Bibles to speak into our, the world in which we live, then we need to identify the world in which we live and bring it into contrast or confluence with the instruction of Scripture. John Thornton wrote to Charles Simeon, a very effective pastor in Oxbridge in an earlier generation. And he wrote to him a word of warning that went like this. Charles, watch continually over your own spirit and do all in love. We must grow downward in humility to soar heavenward. I should recommend you having a watchful eye over yourself. For generally speaking, 
as is the minister, so are the people. And we have, on numerous occasions, turned to that classic position of expressed weakness in 2 Chronicles 20, which you can turn to for your homework, where Jehoshaphat assembles all of the people in the city square, and he says before God, we have no power to face this vast army that is coming upon us. We do not know what to do. And people could have stood on the sideline and said, you call that leadership? We have no power. We don't know what to do. You'll never get a job with that kind of thing. You have to go in and say, I'm very powerful, and I know how to do everything. That's the kind of person they're looking for. That's the kind of girl they need. Really? We have no power. We don't know what to do. You know what the very next phrase is? Then the Spirit of God came. You know when the Spirit of God comes to your life and to a church? When in your life and in mine, you are prepared to say, I am weak. Not I am inherently sinful, because that's sinful, but I am inherently weak. And when we are prepared to get to that place, then we're able to identify with the wonder of what we're told here, namely that the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. So, that is why God brings into our lives, especially those of us who are smart Alex, or smart Alexis, <laughs> those things which will show us our ineffectual dimensions— not so that we can be beaten down, but so that we can discover the wonder of what he delights to do in the lives of those whom he has made his children. We can justifiably recognize that as a father, he watches over us, and he provides for us, and he gives us all things richly to enjoy, including the experiences of pain and illness and marital unsettlement and child-rearing challenges and business eventualities in order that we might make the discovery of Romans 8, 26. It's Andre Crouch, you know, when he says, because if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. So, uh, how's that? It's all coming back to me now. So, I thank him. I thank him for the mountains, and I thank him for the valleys, and I thank him for the things he's brought me through. Because if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in him could do. See, in shunning trials, we miss blessings. In telling everybody how strong we are, we miss the opportunity of discovering how wonderful is the strength that God provides. In suggesting to people that our marriage is entirely intact, and there hasn't been a better marriage since um, 1915, we tell lies, and we fail to make the discovery of God pouring His grace into the fragile nature of our relationships and fulfilling the promise that is here. Well, we could go on generally, and uh, we daren't, because we need to deal with this specifically. And what is he speaking about specifically? Well, he's speaking about prayer. And I hope this is as much an encouragement to you as it has been to me. Because if there is one area of life that shows how weak we really are, especially in our Christian life, is, is it not prayer? Would anybody stand up and say, uh, you know, I, when it comes to prayer, I've got prayer. I've got it buttoned down. I mean, I, I, I pray all the time. I pray, I pray five times a day. I pray sitting. I pray standing and so on. No, you're not going to do that. If you do, you're just silly. 
Now, you're going to be honest with me, and you're going to say, yes, I find prayer really hard. Well, here's the encouragement. God understands that, and he's made a provision for it. In fact, he's made two provisions for it. In verse 34, we'll come to the fact that he has provided in the Lord Jesus one who intercedes for us in heaven. And here in verse 26 and 27, he tells us that he has provided for us the Holy Spirit who does for us in our hearts what Jesus does for us in heaven. So there you are, verse 26, sentence 2. We do not know. That's where we start. We do not know. <laughs> until, until we know what we don't know, we're in trouble. We do not know how we are to pray or what we are to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes. And when you take this apart, you realize that the Spirit of God prays for us. He prays in us. And he prays through us. It's, it's very hard to get, get your head around this. And it says, Warfield, the desires are ours, and the groans are ours, but not apart from the Spirit. They are his, wrought in us by him. Now, I could read that to myself three times slowly and still find myself saying, you what? And I think what Warfield is saying is that the Spirit of God when I say what I'm saying, when I think what I'm thinking, when I come before God, when I'm driving in my car, or when I'm sitting in my home, or in my chair, or wherever it is, or I'm kneeling in my study, and, and you say, this is, this is hopeless. I can't, I, I, can't, I, I can't pray. The Spirit of God is at work saying, what Beg is trying to say is this. What Beg is, what Beg is on about? He doesn't even know what he's on about himself. But I'll tell you what he's on about, Father. That's a great encouragement to me. And I hope it is to you. Because the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. Not just generally, but specifically in the realm of prayer. He prays through us. Says Calvin, the guarantee of the answer to our prayer is found in the nature of their origin. Where does prayer come from? Prayer actually comes from heaven. God is the originator of prayer. That's the thing. We don't pray. People don't pray except for God. People do everything except pray. Oh, the plane drops 1,000 or 1,500 feet in extreme turbulence over the Alps. They start praying then, crying out in all kinds of ways. But by and large, as soon as it all settles down, we're back to where we were before. No, prayer has its origination in heaven. And that's why God answers prayer. You say, this is even more alarming than I thought before. This is so hard to understand. God thoroughly approves, this is still Calvin, our desires as the thoughts of his own spirit. Our Heavenly Father will not refuse to satisfy yearnings which by his own spirit he has put within you. You see, apart from the Spirit of God, we don't know to pray, your will be done. Apart from the Spirit of God, we don't pray, hallowed be your name. Apart from the Spirit of God, we wouldn't pray, your kingdom come. And what if people start doing that and actually meaning it? What's happened to you, says the husband to the wife, that you're saying these prayers and you're writing these things in your journal? What in the world has happened to you? What do you think you're trying to do with all of this? And the husband is alarmed. And justifiably so. And especially when you tell him, the Spirit of God has come to live in me. What? I mean, it was bad enough that you started to go to church, but now you're telling me that God lives in you? That he actually indwells you? Yes. Oh. I don't know what to do with that, he says. Well, we do not know, verse 26, verse 27, but he knows... We do not know. He knows. You've got it all there, don't you? He who searches our hearts is an interesting description of God, isn't it? It's one of the favorite descriptions of God, especially in the Old Testament. You remember when Samuel is going to look for the one who will be anointed king, and God says to Samuel, you look on the outward appearance, but I look on the heart. When Solomon is praying for the dedication of the temple, 
He says, O God, you are the one who searches the hearts of all men. When the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, he says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You know the words of my mouth before I even speak them. This doesn't render prayer irrelevant. This makes prayer effectual. The same God who inspires it and answers it is the God who asks us to do it. He does send us on a fool's errand. Don't fall foul of the notion that because God knows the end from the beginning, prayer is irrelevant. The same God who has ordained the end is the same God who has ordained prayer as a means to bring about the end. And if you have nothing hard to think about, think about that for a little while this afternoon. But God is sovereign over all these things. We don't know. He knows. And I search in vain during the week for a meaningful analogy. I can't come up with an analogy for this. Even the closest thing that I can come to it is still no good. For example, mother with tiny child. You meet little tiny child. Tiny child is in the bucket. You kneel down to say hello to the aforementioned child, and the child says, Hey, and the mother says, Oh, she's saying she just loves to see you and be out here in the park. You're like, What? <laughs> How do you know that? Sounds like gibberish to me. Yeah, but you're not her mother. But even then, the mother doesn't inspire that. But there is something there. There's no doubt there is. Or what about the spouse whose husband has had a major significant stroke and is paralyzed all down one side? And when you go to visit as the pastor and to pray... You're confronted by that saddest of scenes that our one's vibrant, strong body is now debilitated as a result of the ravages of the neurological impact of these things. And his wife says, he says that he's glad that you've come. And he says he would like you to read the Bible and pray with him. And you say to yourself, there has to be some strange, organic intimacy between that couple for her to be able legitimately to make sense of that inarticulate noise. And when your prayers and mine sound like that, the Spirit of God intercedes in them through them, for us. And that is our confidence. Think about this in relationship to prayer and preaching. You remember the apostles in Acts 6? They said, we will give ourselves to prayer and to the preaching of the Word. Prayer and preaching. A congregation like this, for good reasons and for ill, may be tempted to think that the real issue is the preaching. For after all, God has pledged to use this strange means to open up the truth of His Word. Fine. God gives gifts to pastors and to teachers, as He's done within the framework of our pastoral team. But actually, prayer is that which renders preaching effective. And when you read, for example, the words of Jesus in John 16, he says that it is the work of the Spirit of God to bring conviction, and it is the work of the Spirit of God to bring illumination. Conviction and illumination. Now, I spoke early on, didn't I, about uh, how God's glory is marred in us how by nature we're distanced from God, how He has made a great exchange in the gift of Jesus. Some of you are distanced from God. You'd be honest enough to admit that. You, you, you've never come to trust in Jesus. You come to church. You're involved in different things. But you have never—you you couldn't speak in terms of a divine invasion. You, couldn't, you wouldn't speak in those terms. Well, let me ask you, would you, would you today? Would, would you be willing— before you leave today, 
to admit that you're a sinner and that there is no other possibility of reconciliation with God apart from the work of Jesus on the cross. Have you, as you've listened to me today, had any inclination that actually the truth of this book is really the truth? Then if either of the answers to those questions are positive, let me tell you why that is. Not because of my ability to speak, but because of the willingness of God's people to pray. And so I urge you to trust in Christ. And those of you who do trust in Christ, I urge you to pray that others will trust in Christ. For your pastors may preach the exact same sermons to vastly different results, not as a result of a more effective means of articulation, but as a result of intercession. Your intercession, my intercession. But you say, I don't even know how to pray or what to pray. That's okay. The Spirit of God fills in your weaknesses. Here's a closing thought. Maybe Parkside has yet to see what will happen in reaching our communities with the gospel when not only the pastors take up the challenge of proclamation, but when every member of the congregation takes up the challenge of intercession. Because then, you see, it's team. We're all in this together, committed under God to seeing unbelieving people become his committed followers. A challenging message today from Alistair Begg and Truth For Life Weekend. Prayer is not something we just pull out as a last resort or use sentimentally. It's an essential part of fulfilling the Great Commission. And if you are among those who regularly pray for Truth For Life, I want to extend our sincere thanks. Now, we have saved the last few minutes of today's program to hear a closing prayer from Alistair. But before we get to that, this is one of my last opportunities to mention to you a book we've been highlighting this month. It's titled Discovering the Good Life. The author is a pastor named Tim Savage, and Tim reminds us that many of us are merely surviving on this journey of life, but God actually intends for us to be thriving. With Jesus as the central figure in this book, Tim traces the theme of three trees found in Scripture— that will help us put fullness back into life. If you want to see what the abundant life looks like and be motivated to really start living, this book is a wonderful resource. Learn how to request your copy when you visit truthforlife.org. Now here's Alistair with a closing prayer. Gracious God, open our blind eyes to who Jesus is and what he's done and stop our ears, defeat our stubborn wills, and come and help us in our weakness. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with all who believe, now and forevermore. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine. Next time, we continue our study in Romans 8, learning about God's sovereign grace in salvation. This program and the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life, where the learning is for living.